Continue our study in Second uh, Kings, Second Kings, chapter eight. This is another one of these passages which reminds us that God is providentially in control of all of history, <laughs> and uh, He works through the nations to accomplish His will. And much of what He does is to try to bring His people back into repentance. And when they don't respond, he sends more judgment. And so this is one of these passages we're going to be dealing with that. Uh, just like in the book of Habakkuk, uh, God often uses the nations around Israel to punish Israel. Matter of fact, we're living and prophetic history right now with this war over in Israel and the anti-Semitism, which I would never thought I'd see in my lifetime in this country. I mean, it just, and not only anti-Semitism, but the media supporting that, they, they, you know, the poor Palestinians and all that. Um, the Lord says in Ezekiel chapter 20 that he is going to uh, bring his people back to Israel in preparation for judgment. And so when the American Jews are driven out of this country through the anti-Semitism, you could see this unfolding right now on our campuses and, and uh, on, in the media. Uh, we thought after World War II that it couldn't happen here. Well, people are what? People are people. And so we see this. So we see this, and this goes all the way back to the beginning of the Jewish nation, where you have God constantly trying to get the Jews to repent, the Jews being very stubborn, do not. So let's pick this story up here at 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 7. Then Elijah went to Damascus, and Ben Hadad, king of Syria was sick and was told him saying well the man of God has come here and the king said to Hazel uh, take a present in your hand and go meet the man of God and inquire of the Lord by him saying shall I recover from this disease so Hazel uh, went to meet him and took a present with him of every good thing of a Damascus 40 camel loads and he came and stood before him and said, Your son ben Hadad, king of Syria, has sent me to you, saying, Shall I recover from this disease? And Elijah said to him, Go say to him, You shall certainly recover. However, the Lord has shown me that he will really die. Then he set his countenance in a stare until he was ashamed. And the man of God wept. And Hazel said, why is my Lord weeping? And he answered, because I know the evil that you will do to the children of Israel. Their strongholds you will set on fire. Their young men you will kill with a sword. And you will dash their children and rip open the women with a child. So Hazel said, but well, what is your servant, a dog, that he should do this gross thing? And Elisha answered, The Lord has shown me that you will become king over Syria. Then he departed from Elisha and came to his master, who said to him, What did Elisha say to you? And he answered, He told me that you will surely recover. But it happened on the next day, he took a thick cloth and dipped it in water and spread it over his face so that he died and Hazel reigned in his place. Another one of these lovely stories, right? <laughs> There's several points of the narrative that are very unusual, just, just kind of odd. It, it jumps out as, first of all, what is Elisha doing in Damascus, Syria? He's a prophet of what? Of Israel. He's, so he's up here in Damascus, the capital of Syria. Syria, of course, was the enemies of Israel. So what's he doing in a Damascus? We're going to get to that in a second. Secondly, it's odd that Ben-Hadad II 
seeking the Lord through Elisha, the prophet of God. He has his own pagan gods he worships. But Ben Hadan, he is the one who had tried to capture Elisha, remember? Because Elisha kept telling the king of Israel where Syria was going to attack. He wanted to execute Elisha. Uh, Elisha also had warned the king of Israel of Syria's plans and led him, led the army of Syria into uh, Samaria. So here, Ben Hadad, now I want you to notice three things here. Number one, Ben Hadad does not go to his idols. <laughs> He's probably going to his idols before they really haven't done anything for him, right? Secondly, I want, I want you to notice here, he says that Elijah, the prophet of the Lord, he, he acknowledges he's what? The Lord. Well, wait a minute, if he's the Lord, why don't you repent, right, and serve him, like Naaman did. The third thing I notice here, which I think is kind of unusual, is the fact he, Haziel calls Ben Hayden your son. <laughs> In other words, Elijah is the father in the sense that Elijah has connection with the Lord God and therefore has a superior position. And so all this is kind of odd. Now Ben Hayden has taken what a lot of people take as the magic genie approach to God. Uh, I ignore God till what? Till I need him. <laughs> and then when I need him, oh God, I, you know, if you, you would do this and this and this, you know, then I will do this. Well, Quite often, even Christians approach God in that magic genie approach. It's the fact that, Lord, I need this and this and this and this. And not so much so they're expecting God to basically pull the rabbit out of the hat for him. <laughs> and, and yet they do not worship him any other time, right? So we approach God whenever we need him. And, and of course, that's not the relationship we're to have with the Lord. Quite often, the Lord send things in our life so that we might be uh, repentant and humble ourselves and serve him. So he knows Elijah represents the one true God. He's heard about the miracles. He's experienced them himself. Every time he wanted to attack Israel, Elijah says, okay, don't go this way because they're planning on going this way. Uh, but in the bottom line, ben Hadad still does not repent, but he wants an answer from God. Um, that's pretty selfish, right? I want God to do something for me, but I surely do not want to submit my will to his. It doesn't work that way. Now, why is Elijah in Damascus? He wasn't there to visit the restaurants. <laughs> and well, back, we have to go back to 1 Kings chapter 19 to find an answer. Now remember what happened in 1 Kings 18. That was the confrontation on Mount Carmel where you know you had the prophets of Baal and Asherah going around and around and trying to call fire down from heaven. They can't do it. Elijah's mock, Elijah's mock, mock them, remember, said, well, where's your God? Maybe he's, maybe he's asleep. Maybe you need to shout louder, you know, or maybe he's taking a walk. He's on a journey somewhere, uh, you know, Maybe he's contemplating his own greatness. I mean, where, so Elijah calls out to the one true God after he douses the offering three times with water and fire comes down. Well, in chapter 19, Jezebel sent him a love note. <laughs> Say, may your life be like one of these prophets by tomorrow at the same time. <laughs> And so Elijah is, is scared, he's, he's exhausted, he, he, he runs and he goes there, he finally uh, sits under a terrible tree, he said, Lord, you might as well just take my life, and the angel comes and gives him food, said the journey's too much for you, gives him water, uh, has him sleep, and he walks 40 days down to uh, Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, 
And then that's where God says, uh, uh, what, what are you doing down here, Elijah? And the implication is what? I didn't call you down here. You know, if, if, uh, if, if God could protect Elijah down at Mount Horeb, he could have protected Elijah yeah, back up there in Israel, right? <laughs> Secondly, Elijah, of course, was having a pity party, right? He said, well, you know, they've killed all your prophets, and I'm the only one left, and there's no one that left to serve you, and I'm the last guy. Well, God tells him, by the way, there's 7,000 others that haven't bowed their knee to Baal. Now, what does that have to do with what we're talking about this morning? Well, God gives him an assignment. I want you to notice a couple things God does. He does the same thing with Moses. He does the same thing with Jeremiah. He doesn't give this, oh, you poor fellow, <laughs> sympathy. He, tell, he, he gives him another assignment. <laughs> he said, okay, Elijah, gird yourself. And remember, he went through that whole thing that's, that's quite often repeated as, you know, that he wasn't in the wind and he wasn't in the earthquake and he wasn't, but he speaks in a what? Still small voice. I mean, basically he's telling Elijah, I'm not always going to be bringing fire down from heaven or thunder down on the mountains. I'm not, you know, sometimes I whisper <laughs> in the night. And so, so he gave Elijah three tasks. He said, number one, I want you to go anoint Elisha to take your place. And so he was going to go up to anoint Elisha. Secondly, I want you to anoint Haziel. Ah, there's Haziel. Remember, that's back in the last book, Haziel to be king over Syria. Thirdly, I want you to anoint Jehu. We haven't come to that point yet. Jehu is king over Israel. And Jehu is quite an interesting guy. We're going to talk about him a little bit later on. But so, so Elijah only performed the first task which was to anoint uh, Elisha to take his place. He didn't do the other two tasks. So he's passing that, he passed that task on to Elisha. So Elisha has to fulfill the other two tasks, to, to anoint Haziel to be king over Syria and to anoint Jehu to be king over Israel. So Elijah didn't accomplish those, but Elisha continues his assignment. So ben Hadan sends his top aide, Haziel, to inquire of Elisha. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things about Haziel. Haziel uh, is not part of the royal line. He's not part of ben Hadan's family. Secondly, because what happens, it doesn't seem like ben Hadan has an heir at this point. We're going to talk about that in a second. So ben Hadan is sick, very sick. He's laying on his bed. I don't think he had COVID-19, but he was very sick of something. <laughs> and uh, he, he wanted to know if he's going to recover. So, and before we talk about that, it's amazing what Ben Hayden does. He, he sends 40 camels loads of gifts to the prophet. I mean, this is even better than Naaman's, right? I mean, he sends, you know, this gold and silver and tapestry and, and, and dates and, and all kinds of things doesn't say anything. What happened to these gifts is probably, most commentators agree, he probably turned them down just like he turned Naaman's down. I don't want your gifts, you know. That's quite a bit to turn down, you know. Say, so, well, he can give them to the poor or whatever, you know, but we're not told. He's got 40 camels there full of gifts. got a whole train load here of stuff for him. This is called the uh, Sears uh, Fee. And so we see that when we talked about uh, Saul. So Ben Hayden sends Hazel. Hazel, the word Hazel means God sees. So what does God see? He well, sees everything. <laughs> he sees everything. So Hazel means God sees, which I find interesting because this is actually a Hebrew name. What's, what's he doing with a Hebrew name here? He, gives, he sends the, the, you know, these great gifts, the seer's feet, to inquire from Elijah. Elisha well, probably turned down the gifts, uh, but Hazel's intent at this point is unclear. Now, watch what happens. Elisha gives a confused answer. He says he's going to recover from his illness, but he's really going to die. Well, what does that mean? Well, this is what it means. It means he's not going to die from the sickness. <laughs> He'll recover from that, 
but he's, but he's, he's going to die anyway because he's going to be killed. You know, now you, you notice when Hazel reports back, he doesn't give him the second part of this. Only the first part. Because Elisha says, I know that you're going to be the king over Syria. All right. And so Elisha gives his confused answer. He says, you know, you're not going to die from the sickness. But you're going to die anyway. <laughs> So then Elisha glares, the word stare here means the see-through. Elijah glares at Hazel and then starts weeping. And Hazel's confused and says, what's, go what's going on? Why is my Lord crying? And Elisha says, listen, the Lord has revealed to me that you're going to become king over Israel. And not only are you going to be king over Israel, you're going to brutalize my people. You're going to kill the men by the sword. You're going to rape the women. You're going to cut women with, who are pregnant with children wide open. You're going to do all these despicable, brutalized things. Because the Lord has revealed it. And you're going to raid and you're going to do all these things. to people. And Hazel protested, am I such a dog to do such a despicable thing? Elisha said, listen, the Lord's revealed it. You're going to do it. And so I, I want you to notice two things here at this point, too. Is one, Hazel acknowledges it's a despicable thing. But number two, once he becomes king, he does it anyway. Right? And so when he becomes king, he becomes brutal, and he becomes... He becomes uh, uh, very aggressive. So Hazel delivers the news to Ben Hayden. Ben Hayden says, "You know, what did what did Elisha tell you?" He says, "He says you're going to recover from from the sickness." He leaves out the second part <laughs> that he's going to die anyway. Uh, Hazel is not part of the royal line. He is probably uh, his head general at this point. Uh, an attache or whatever thing. So the, on the next day, Hazel takes a wet cloth, puts it over the king's mouth and, and, and smothers him. And it's an easy way to kill the king because people will assume he died of what? Died of his illness. <laughs> so Hazel's going to be able to get with this because after all, well, the king was very sick. And Hazel comes out and says, oh, the king's, the king's dead. You know, must have died of his illness. You know, and so he's able to do this. So Hazel takes the throne. And I imagine, it's not, it doesn't say here, but I imagine Hazel probably came out and said something in a very contrite way. <laughs> said something like, uh, you know, uh, the king doesn't have any any son to take over. And so right before he died, he appointed me to be the next king. Because it looks like Hazel takes over without, you know, anyone protesting. And the only one that would have heard it would have been Hazel. So he comes and I imagine he said something like that. Well, you know, since I'm the top eight anyway, right? You know, so... I've been appointed to be the next king over Syria. How convenient. So Hazel takes the throne from Ben-Hadad II. Ben-Hadad II ruled 18 years from 860 to 842 B.C. No, that's not in your Bible. That's part of the history of the ancient world. Hazel, who was called in history, by the way, the son of no one. Why was he the son of no one? He had a father, he had a mother. Well, he was a son of no one because he wasn't part of royal line. He wasn't anywhere close to royalty. He wasn't the son of he wasn't the son of of anyone who would have legitimate claim to the throne. So he's known in history as the son of no one. He's also called Shalomanser the Third. I don't know why they have different names all over the place, but that's by history knows him as Shalomanser the Third. So that's that's who he is. I like Hazel better. It's easier to pronounce. <laughs> now, Hazel rules for 41 years. 
from 840 to 800 BC, he was brutal. Uh, matter of fact, not only was he brutal, he was a very, very aggressive man. Hazel does raids and wars and destruction. Hazel, this is the guy who takes away all of Israel east of the Jordan River. They never, they never get it back. So that's the area where, what, you had Reuben and Gad and one half of Manasseh. It's known in the Old Testament as the area of Gilead. You know, Hazel takes that away, conquers it. This is the area, remember, that, that David had to fight the Ammonites. This is that same area. Conquers it, and Israel never gets it back. Matter of fact, today they don't have it back. That, that area is in the country of what? Yeah, well, yeah, in the Jordan. Yeah. So that is Jordan and, and, of course, Syria in the northeast, north, uh, east of that. And so uh, all that's the area of Jordan. They never got it back. You know, and so all that, Hazel's the guy that does this. In his history, he's the guy that takes them all over and, and, and kicks them out. As a matter of fact, uh, and, and the battle, he also took Gath and uh, Philistia, which I find interesting because Philistia is nowhere near Syria. <laughs> he took Gath. Uh, he wounded Jehoram at Ramoth Gilead uh, when he took the eastern part of Jordan. He attacked Judah and was about to take that over. Judah, the king of Judah, was uh, uh, Jehoaz at the time. And Jehoaz pays him a tribute to leave his country. He said, I'll give you all this silver stuff like that if you just would leave us alone. And so he takes back the booty that he would have gotten anyway if he took Judah. So, so he took that act. This is a very brutal guy. Now God will use brutal means to chastise an unrepentant people who refuse to humble themselves. Um, we see that throughout the Old Testament. We see that in the New Testament. You know, he's going to th throw this Jezebel. There's three things he tells the Thyatiran church about Jezebel. So number one, you haven't taken care of it. Number two, I gave her time to repent. She would not do so. Number three, I'm going to take over now. And I'm going to kill all our children. And I'm going to throw her in a bed of affliction. And so, if the church doesn't take care of what it's supposed to take care of, God will take care of it. We have that over in 1 Corinthians 5, where the man takes his father's uh, wife. He says, okay, Corinthians, not only, uh, not only have you not taken care of this, but you have kind of agreed with it. You've kind of treated, I mean, even pagans don't do that. Therefore, I tell him, you kick him out of the church and let Satan you know, uh, be a thorn in his flesh, you know, to, to chastise him. If we don't take care of the things God tells us to take care of, then God says, I'll take care of it. And it's a lot rougher. Because the church is supposed to do what? It's supposed to bring people back to repentance, right? And so, woe unto the man who falls into the hands of a living God. That's exactly right. And so throughout Judges, God sends raiders and, and people to attack Israel. Israel and Judah remain stubborn. Finally, in 722 B.C. Now, at this point, you were within a century of Israel being taken away. And then after that, another uh, 150 years later, Judah's taken away. Okay. Now, some like David repented after they were confronted. Uh, the prodigal son repents, right? Luke chapter 15. But many do not. Revelation 16, 9, and they still would not repent. The repentant need not go through the chastisement because they already have come back to the Lord. But the more stubborn we are, the more pressure the Lord puts on. Matter of fact, we have communion this morning. And we see that in 1 Corinthians 11. Many of you are sick and many are you, have you what? Fall asleep. Many of you died because you have taken the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. 
And so it's, you know, I think that's what the songwriter went through when he wrote the song. And it, uh, it's best to let him have his way with thee. <laughs> you know, I can imagine Jonah might have done something different had he known. <laughs> Say, Jonah, you can get there on your own two feet or I can provide transportation for you. It's not first class accommodations. <laughs> you know, so we either get there by obeying the Lord or the Lord will have his way and we will remember when the Lord, you know, leads us in a direction. Okay, let's have a word of prayer and we'll have a discussion. I think it's kind of an interesting passage. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being here this morning. We just pray, Lord, that you just draw us ever closer to you. And Lord, may we not be stubborn. May we stand for what's right and what's true. And may we repent. I mean, even these kings that are mentioned here see the power of God. Yet do not submit to you, Lord. Lord, may that not be so with us that we might submit and, and come before you and, and honor you, Lord, and, and, and obey you in all things. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.